Over the decades, the Suicide Squad has been a revolving door of villains from all across the DC Universe, acting as a showcase for the worst of the worst. And a while back, I decided to read every issue of the Suicide Squad ever made, including the really bad stuff. Shout out to Harley Quinn tying up and making out with Deadshot while forcing him to wear the sliced off face of the Joker. Now, I already made a comprehensive list of every character who has ever died on the squad, but while looking through so much history, it was surprising to see just how many insanely powerful villains have been drafted over the years. So as someone who is cursed with all this knowledge, and is trying to milk the research I already did for multiple videos, let's take a look. But before we get too far into things, I need to give a quick thank you to the sponsor for today's video, Geology. Now, it's no secret that I spend way, way, way too many long nights reading all these comics, and I have been getting some serious dark rings under my eyes, which is why I am super glad that Geology reached out. They make skincare routines that are personalized for exactly what you need. Acne, wrinkles, sensitive skin, or my dark circles. Now in order to get the right routine for you, simply take their quick 30 second quiz and you'll get a personalized daily routine that directly tackles your skincare goals. By using my link, you can check out the 30 day trial, which includes a morning face wash and a cream, as well as a repairing cream for both your face and your eyes. Plus, you actually get two bottles of the face wash, one to keep at home and one to take with you on the go for like work or the gym. If you love the results and want to keep going, then you can subscribe for 90 days for a discount or just buy the products as you need. You are in total control. With over 3,000 five-star reviews and an average rating of 4.7 out of five, this is a must try. So go ahead and check out geology.com or click the link below to take the free skincare quiz and save up to 50% off a 30-day trial. You really won't regret it. So thanks again, Geology, for sponsoring the video, but now let's get back to it. Now, trying to figure out who to include in this video was a bit difficult because there are lots of folks that are totally worth mentioning, but they aren't really that kind of high level to make the cut. For example, there's a whole slew of villains that for all intents and purposes, just boil down to big strong dude. This includes characters like Bane, King Shark, Blockbuster, The General, Killer Croc, Giganta, Atom Smasher, Mongol, and Solomon Grundy. There's also world-class assassins like Bloodsport, Black Manta, Deathstroke, and Peacemaker. But when they're taking on high-level threats, it's usually because of meticulous planning and advanced weaponry. In order to be considered truly one of the most powerful of all time, then a character needs to be something special and probably have intense superpowers. So let's hop in with this first batch. Superman villains. I mean, if you're able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the most powerful superhero of all time, then you're probably pretty tough. Starting us off is a bit of an overlooked villain, since he's usually seen as boring and basic. Parasite. He might just look like someone that was bitten by a radioactive wad of bubblegum, but this dude is a legitimately major threat. Parasite has similar powers to Rogue from the X-Men, in that he can absorb the life force of other beings, which includes their memories and powers. However, he can also absorb pretty much any energy source, which makes every single long distance attack from superhumans more or less useless against him. And if you get too close for a melee attack, then you're putting yourself at being risk of being drained. Even without taking someone's life force, the Parasite is super strong and durable as is. For example, his time on the squad featured this scene of Parasite letting Harley Quinn shoot rockets at him for fun. That means that more or less every attack that you throw at him is useless, and if he's able to feed off someone like Superman, then he becomes somehow even more dangerous. Seriously, Parasite is a really overlooked villain, and he really needs more love. But if you're inspired to go check out some of his comics, then just know that multiple people have taken on this role, with two of them, Rudy Jones and Joshua Allen, having been on the squad. But to be completely honest, they are more or less interchangeable, so just read whatever. Back when Lex Luthor was president of the United States, he had Amanda Waller create a suicide squad made out of entirely Superman foes, like the aforementioned Parasite, but its leader was a much lesser known character named Manchester Black. This guy is a cocky, sarcastic, and overall just unpleasant dude, but he's also one of the most powerful psychics in the DC Universe. His telekinesis is strong enough to lift heavy objects and throw Superman around like a ragdoll but it's also precise enough to target the apparently super durable capillaries in Clark's brain and pinch them to give him something close to a stroke. This only temporarily debilitated Superman, but for any other person, that would be an instant kill. But of course, Black isn't just a telekinetic. He's also a top tier telepath, who has been shown to be strong enough to control and influence dozens of supervillains at once, block mental probing from Martian Manhunter, and can rewrite memories to such a degree that he can basically make anyone forget anything. 
In recent continuity, Manchester Black was drafted on once again when he was kidnapped by Waller to be part of something called Task Force XI, a daisy chain of psychics that were forcibly used to power a big psionic weapon. Since then though, he has been completely squad free. But here is something truly wild. Freaking General Zod was on the Suicide Squad. Yeah, as in the Kryptonian general with all the strength and powers of Superman. See, the team accidentally freed him from the Phantom Zone while on a mission, and they were able to knock him out since he wasn't at his full strength yet. Amanda Waller, being Amanda Waller, didn't hesitate to grab some kryptonite, which she of course had laying around in case Superman went rogue, and used it to put a bomb in Zod's brain. Now, General Zod is not one to take orders, especially from a human, and he only ran with the squad for a couple of missions before brutally removing the bomb himself with his heat vision. But oddly enough, Zod wasn't the only Kryptonian to join the squad. Kind of. Okay, so at the beginning of the 2021 series, it was revealed that Waller was able to get Superboy on the team. He's far from the first hero that Waller got her hands on, but his presence just seemed… off. His memories were hazy, and he was wearing the t-shirt and jeans look from the mid-2000s, which is a major contrast to the last time that we saw him, rocking the classic leather jacket look. Now, changing costumes isn't a big deal and normally wouldn't be the cause for alarm, but because of the way, way, way too complicated multiversal shenanigans that would require its own video to explain, Superboy's existence is… was… tricky. That combined with the abrupt wardrobe change caused fans to speculate that these were in fact two separate characters. And surprise, they were. It turns out that the Suicide Squad Superboy was actually Match, a clone of him from the 90s. Yeah, since Superboy is already a clone, that makes Match a clone of a clone, which clearly isn't good for the old genetic code, because over the years, Match started to deteriorate, becoming a dumb and hulking shell of his former self. It also turns out that Waller was using a serum to stabilize Match, and also implanted false memories in his head, hence the amnesia and him thinking that he was the real deal. But the jig was up when the actual Superboy came face to face with him. Oh, and Waller was also making clones of Match. Clones of a clone of a clone. At the time of this recording, Match is still on the active Suicide Squad, and I am personally really excited to see what they do with him moving forward, because honestly, I think that this is really fascinating shit. But okay, let's get off of these Superman-related characters. The Enchantress is one of the founding members of the Suicide Squad all the way back in 1986, and she has been on a lot of incarnations of the team. She is also one of the most powerful magic users in the DC Universe, and can pretty much do anything because magic. Her deal is a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde situation, where she is split between the mild-mannered personality of June Moon and the evil Enchantress, with only the latter being able to form magic. June originally joined the team in hopes of getting her Enchantress persona under control, and in the recent continuity, she was kept on the squad by her love for fellow teammate Killer Croc. I know that probably sounds weird, but the dynamic between the two of them kind of worked, and there was actually a fun issue that revolved around how the rest of the world perceived her relationship with the big crocodile man and how everybody needs to kill him with fire. Also, June worked on Suicide Squad Black, a special team that was formed to handle magical threats. That team's leader was El Diablo. He is an extremely powerful pyrokinetic that's been on both versions of the squad for a good while. He's kind of like Ghost Rider over at Marvel Comics, in that he gets his powers from a Demon of Vengeance. This guy is an unstoppable force to his very core, and he can burn people like crazy. And when I say unstoppable, I really mean it, because when El Diablo dies, the Demon of Vengeance just brings him back to life over and over and over again. Though, despite Retribution being his entire thing, El Diablo is currently a pacifist, only killing when it's truly necessary. And that puts him at odds with the demon inside of him, but when it comes down to it, El Diablo can fully let the demon inside of him and transform into a huge fire beast of seemingly limitless power. Now, going from extreme heat to extreme cold, there's Killer Frost. Now, there have been a couple of characters that have taken up this mantle and have been a part of the Suicide Squad, but while Louise Lincoln is pretty much just a chick with ice powers, Caitlyn Snow is on a whole different level. See, Caitlyn is a quote-unquote heat vampire, and the more heat that she absorbs, the stronger and more dangerous she becomes. Outside of a compelling inner struggle and solid character development, there's not much to Killer Frost that's all that different from any other run-of-the-mill ice user. But the heat that Caitlyn can absorb can come from all sorts of places. Like for instance, Superman. 
he's powered by solar energy, and when the Suicide Squad fought the Justice League, Killer Frost was able to drain Supes of almost the entirety of his energy reserves, which was accidentally converted into an ice storm so powerful that it incapacitated the entire Justice League. This lady is a stone cold killer. Keeping with the elemental theme, Poison Ivy was actually on the Suicide Squad for a bit. Although this was in 1990 and Ivy wasn't nearly as strong as she is today, where she's able to literally take over the entire planet and communicate through any being through a leafy hive mind, but still, she's always been a major threat. Poison Ivy has complete control over plant life and everything that entails. She can restrain people and destroy buildings with massive vines, create toxins and poisons, control folks with their pheromones, and even create clouds of THC. You can obviously thank Kevin Smith for that when he wrote Batman the Widening Dyer. And totally unrelated, but that book also had this panel. And I love it. Honestly, even though it's fantastic that the Suicide Squad is a spotlight for lesser known villains in the DC Universe, it's still always a treat to see Batman baddies show up from time to time, because they are some of the best and most iconic that the company has to offer. I mean, I know that Deadshot and Harley Quinn are mainstays at this point, but I love the occasional penguin. Next up, Lashina. She is one of the new gods, a literal godlike race that lives outside of conventional reality. Specifically, Lashina is a member of the Female Furies, an elite and highly skilled team of warriors trained to serve the ruler of Apocalypse, Darkseid. Lashina was stranded on Earth after a mission when she was pushed out of a boom tube by one of her jealous teammates, and in order to find a way back home, Lashina takes up the identity of Duchess and gets roped into the Suicide Squad, which she actually stays with for a good while before hitching a ride back to Apocalypse. Then there's Chemo. It's not really a person, but rather a huge sentient vat of toxic waste. Chemo was created by accident, being the result of multiple failed science experiments that achieved low-level sentience and intelligence. It's basically just a huge radioactive monster that spews toxic chemicals. Chemo can kind of be aimed at certain tasks, but for more control for the squad, Amanda Waller utilized some psychic technology that she got from a captured supervillain, and was able to remote pilot the big goopy boy. Also, whenever she's controlling it, Chemo basically turns into a huge green Waller, and that's... that's terrifying. Alright, so this one is actually really strange. Grant Morrison is one of the most famous writers over at DC Comics, and during their incredibly influential series Animal Man, the book got extremely meta and played with the idea of writers and their creations, culminating in Animal Man actually meeting Morrison. As the writer, Morrison can make anything happen. The only limit is their imagination and DC's editorial staff. However, by inserting themselves into the book, Grant Morrison became an established character within the DC universe, which means that they could be written into other stories like, say, Suicide Squad. It's never explained how Morrison was found or what kind of leverage was used to get him on the squad, but even though the fictional Morrison was being handled by a different writer entirely, something the character makes sure to comment on, they still seem to have omniscient power, being able to type things into existence. Armed with a mobile keyboard, Morrison was thrown into the field with the rest of the squad, only to be plagued by the death of all authors, writer's block. And this is literal death, because unable to think of what happens next, Morrison was left vulnerable and was taken out in the heat of battle. If we want to talk about breaking the fourth wall though, we have to talk about Ambush Bug. Basically, Ambush Bug is DC's Deadpool, an annoying little shit who's constantly breaking the fourth wall and making attempts at being funny, which frequently fall flat. Fun fact though, Ambush Bug was actually made before Deadpool and was doing the whole routine years before the Merc with the Mouth went from a generic gun for hire with a couple of jokes to the walking meme that he is today. As a comedy character, Ambush Bug can do whatever he wants, logic be damned. He was first brought into the Suicide Squad in the 80s, but in a very small cameo that was so easy to miss that I reread this issue multiple times specifically trying to find him and missed it every time. There he is, right there. However, Ambush Bug was given a more upfront and extremely in-your-face role in the pages of the 2021 series, and it's clear that DC is seriously trying to court the Deadpool crowd, but they completely missed the mark with him and derailed what was a halfway decent book into something that is just painful to get through. Some comedy characters are a bit more enjoyable though, such as the main man, Lobo. This dude is 90s incarnate, a crude overpowered edgelord that's too cool for school. He's super strong, extremely durable, can survive the vacuum of space without any kind of protection, and has what is probably the most extreme healing factor in all of comics. Yeah, Lobo can regenerate himself from a single drop of blood, which he can also use to make infinite duplicates of himself. 
In recent continuity, Lobo was a member of the first ever Suicide Squad, but because of his absolutely insane healing abilities, a bomb in the head really wasn't good enough motivation for him to join in, and we've actually seen his head be blown up before and grow back. So what could possibly be used to bring Lobo into the fold? Simple. Cold hard cash. Hell yeah. But hey, I also want to get paid, so if you like this video, then please consider watching more, like maybe the episode that I did on everyone who ever died in the squad. I'd really appreciate it. But also, please consider subscribing. I've got a lot more videos planned, and I think you might like them. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this, and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye.